you today about how to raise a template the first year of a backend driven UI. And I need to talk to you, of course, I don't have one candle, I have eight, I know, but just bear with me, that's the only cake I could find. So you might be wondering, what is this, what is this thing with this title? What is what, how to raise a template? And for that, I have to explain two things. So, as Daniel explained before, I'm an engineering manager at Clue. So what do we do at Clue? Clue is a female health app that our mission is to help women understand their bodies better. So that is the first thing. The second thing is I love puns. I love them. I really like to make connections between songs, books, or just fun facts to be able to understand better. So the pun or the relationship here is I gave this first talk so a few months ago, and it was called How, What to Expect When You're Templating. And this is a reference, <laughs> Daniel said that, this is a reference to a book a lot of women get in the United States when they're pregnant. And as the title says, in this book you understand like month by month what is happening in the body of a woman when she's pregnant. So the relationship between software development is that, for example, if you're in agile development, you have two weeks of development and you know exactly what is going to happen and the checkpoints that you have to have. But the differences between pregnancy and software development is that we don't want to wait nine months to be able to ship something to our users that is from value. So the second part of this talk is one year later. So one year later has passed with the system that is being out there, and if I make a reference to a kid, now it's taking its first step, it's almost saying mom or dad, we still don't know, and we are running behind it taking pictures and putting it on Instagram, because we're very proud of it. So, Second disclaimer of the night, again, I work on a health app, and you're gonna see illustrations on this kind of site. I hope it's okay with you, and if not, at least you will learn something anatomically correct today. <laughs> okay, so what's gonna be your journey today? The first thing I'm going to talk to you about is our reasoning behind. So why did we decide to go from the traditional way of developing apps or developing UI features to the backend driven UIs? The second thing I want to talk to you about is our architectural decisions and to see like the pyramids if they lasted for more than a year. The third thing is because I like to really live on the edge and I promise this time my computer is charged, I'm gonna do a demo with live coding. So hopefully everything will be fine. And the last but not least, I'm going to talk to you about the lessons that I have learned and we have learned as a company. So let's take a trip to the past. And to be able to take a trip to the past, I'm gonna call my two best friends for that. Okay, how much in the past are we going to go? Let's go to the conception. Okay, so let's have a journey on a software development company. So most of the times when you're doing software development, you have a product owner. The product owner does a series of interviews with um, users and come up with new features that will be helpful for them. The product owner gets together with the product designer and the product designer transforms that feature into a visual concept that the user, uh, the, sorry, developers can implement. So in our case, our visual concept is delivered to the developers through a tool called Zeppelin. So when that visual um, interaction is set, the tickets are put into our sprint. The next thing that we do is we use Xcode. For most of development, we use Xcode to create our views, to create our features, and to create, as we have seen today in a lot of talks, tests. So once we're ready with this, we present this to the product owner for acceptance criteria, the designers for, product re for design review, and the QA engineers to test uh, manual test this app. So the next thing that we do, of course, we upload it or App Store Connect. So how many of you remember the times when Apple took around a week to accept? Okay, I don't need to tell my age, but I'm glad. <laughs> so for those of you who didn't know, Apple used to take a week or so to be able to accept apps, and if it was in a specific kind of year, you had to do math to be able to figure out if you're going to deliver at the correct time. So once Apple approves and your app is out there, then it's out to the users. But some things can happen. 
Maybe the color that you implemented is not the best color. Maybe there's something that you miss. And if you don't have an A-B testing system, this can be a bit cumbersome. So this process starts again. Oh, come on. Again. And if you are in a software development kind of company with those agile methodologies, this process takes around two weeks. And that's what we said to our product owners and product designers. And their response was this. <laughs> of course, as we all know, pigs is knowledge, so. Okay, so they wanted us to find something that we wanted to bring value to our users in an iterative and fast way. That is where the backend driven UI is good. So the backend driven UI concept, even though a lot of companies are using it, it's not, so, it's not such a uh, new concept. Actually, the first um, thing I could investigate of when this was out was in WWC 10. And we had a session there that is called Building a Server-Driven User Experience. And I'm going to read to you what was this session about. This session would show how powerful server-side technologies and Cocoa Touch best practices make it easy to remotely update native user interface and data structure in deployed mobile applications. So that means Apple is absolutely okay with this kind of uh, development. So after we thought about that, we wanted to see, is there any other companies that are using it? And here I have to give a shout out to John Sandel, because in 2015, I saw a talk about backend driven UIs and the Hub framework, which is what Spotify was using for the backend driven UIs. Sadly, right now, it's deprecated. But there's also some other companies who are currently using, such as Airbnb, Zalando, and SoundCloud. Okay, so Apple approved it, and there's some other companies doing it. How do we do this our way? So, here I'm going to show you our templates. So, we have what is called a What's New box. In the What's New box, the users get a lot of personalized data or personalized news related to their tracking symptoms. And this had to be flexible. So you're able to add, for example, an image, a logo, one button, two buttons, whatever you wanted to add. So this is what our designers ask. So let's dive a bit deep into this card. So they wanted us to not come up and like, okay, this is template one, this is template two, and this is template three. You create several templates for that. They wanted us to be flexible. So the best thing we thought about this is transform it into Lego blocks. So as you can see, the card that we have before can be divided or separated into several segments. So we have spacers, a header, image, text, and a button. Okay. So the next thing that we wanted to do is that we, are, we wanted to actually code this. But I think the most important thing that we did is that we sat down together, Android developers, backend developers, iOS developers, and product owners to try to come up with a, natural, so a language that we all speak. So if we all talk about spacers, we know exactly what it means. If we talk about colors, we know exactly what it means. So we came up with a lot of documentation. Let's take the example of the spacer. So our spacer has the following parameters. So we have a field called size, because we need to determine how big or what is the height of this spacer. So it is a field that is required, we determine like that, and then we have the possible values. The possible values in this case can be Small, medium, large, or extra large. When we talk about small, we could say it's two pixels, four pixels, six pixels, and so on. So we didn't want it to get together to map those numbers. We wanted to use words in this case. And what we also added was a description of what this segment can do, because not only developers are going to read this. So we wanted everybody in the company to understand what does it mean for each kind of a segment. So in the case of a spacer, you know that it inserts a blank vertical space in your card. So once what that was defined, our backend developers grab this and transform it into a JSON. So the JSON response that we're going to get is segments. It's an array of segments which is going to have a type, in this case a spacer, a body, and the size is going to be medium. So okay, now everything is set. The next step we have to do is implement this on the mobile clients. So we are done with our reasoning. Let's go to our architectural approach. And I have to say, our code base is a bit old. And by old, I mean it's intertwined. 
So we have what is called the spaghetti code, and we wanted to do something different. So we see the value of having modules that have clear ownership. So what we decided to do is that, okay, this project is going to be modularized. So what are the kind of modules that we have? So we have three modules that take uh, care of our backend driven development. So the first module that we have on the client is the communication module. The second one is logic, and the third one is UI. So I'm gonna dive a bit deep into these modules. So the communication module, as its name says, is a connection between the app and the backend. So this module, like here, is always constantly listening to what the backend has new information, extract the information, and store it into the device to be able to be parsed uh, later into views. It also sends the interactions that the user have, because it's important for us to know what did the user do. Did the user click the card? Did the user interacted with it? Did the user dismissed it? And once that information has been sent back to the backend, the backend can recalculate and try to find out if there's something more relevant that it needs to show. So the second is the logic. So it knows what to present on the what's new box, which is business logic in this case, adding, removing, updating, and fetching all the cards that are relevant for the users inside of the device, not from the backend. And last but not least, we have the UI, which knows how to present the cards. This is the module that will get the JSON response and create the views for it to be sent to the app and be displayed to the users. This module also gets the user interaction packages and send it back to the communication model so the communication model sends it back to the backend. That's a bit of a mouthful to say. <laughs> okay, so let's go a bit on our parsing and rendering process. And to be able to explain this, I'm gonna use a visual image for that of one of my favorite movies. And I hope you all have seen it because if not, it's gonna take a while for me to explain. So how many of you have seen Inception? Yes, I don't have to explain. <laughs> so as Inception, we have several layers. If you remember Leonardo DiCaprio started in the reality, then went through several dreams and ended up in the limbo. This is the best way that I can explain what do we do on our parsing process. And let's start on the reality on the airplane. So what does a normal clue user do? A normal clue user starts tracking their symptoms. They can track if they're happy, if they're sad, if they're motivated, um, what is your type of, if you have eaten sugar or not. Once you track that information, we send that back to the backend. So what the backend does is says, okay, the user tracked they're happy. Let me show them this content that will be, will be appropriate. So the user, sorry, the backend finds that, okay, this is the content I want to show and packages it into a specific kind of template that it knows what to show to the user. So once the backend knows, okay, this is what I'm going to show, it sends back the information. But we're not doing the usual polling. We're not doing, using webhooks. We're using server set events. And the server sent event allowed the clients to receive a stream of updates from a server over an HTTP connection without, sorry, oh, sorry, without, uh, ah, pretend that you didn't see that, okay. without resorting to polling. Um, and unlike I said, to webhook, this is just a one communication set, so from the backend to the client. So once the client detects that there's new information, the communication module starts its magic. So what does the communication module get? The communication module it gets segments. This segment, again, is a JSON response, but our app does not know what to do with that. So what we do is we grab the raw data and put it into an object that we can parse, that we can work with, that's called the car view response. And it's gonna be put there as this colorful confetti. So once we have the car view response, we send that back to our UI module. But of course, this is just a compendium of a lot of data and a lot of the parsers do not know how to parse a whole thing that has different kind of components. So what we have to do is we have to separate this data into individual chunks, like this. So it could be, for example, a text, an image, and a button. So if we go one level deeper, then we have our raw data that we don't know how to parse. We have an element called a view provider decoder, which has a list of the potential segments that you can have. 
So what it does, it says, okay, the first one, I know what it could be, so I'm going to provide you an image decoder. The second one, I'm going to provide you a button decoder. And then the third one, I know it's a text, so I'm going to present to you a text decoder. So once we have those three decoders that know exactly what to do, they can't live by itself like that. That's not what the card does. So what we do is we find out the logic and we put them together into our final card. So let's recap. What do we do normally? So let's start at the reality. In the reality, our device receives our JSON response. Then if we go one level deeper, we store the data as a string value on the card response, which is the confetti thing that I showed you before. Then if we go one level deeper, our card view model gets the JSON and extracts the list of segments that it has. Then the view provider decoder detects the type of individual segments and sends it back to the correct view model for it to parse the data. And once it parses the data, it will create a view to be configured with the data from the view model. So this is what we normally do when we're parsing information. So has this lasted for a year? Yes, it did. So now let's come back to today. So the last time I talked about this, we were, had several steps that we wanted to do. But now those several steps actually transform into our current state. So one of the things that we actually wanted to do some time ago, the first thing we wanted to do is full screen templates. So we have right now, as you see before, condensed cards. Condensed cards are just helpful if you want to do, say, tidbits or say something small and important for the users. But if the users want to read more, you have to provide them with a full screen template. The second thing that we wanted to do is we want to incorporate more animations. And as we saw with the talk of Michael, animations are um, engaging. They're really wonderful to see, and they attract the user a bit much more. And the last thing we wanted to do is we wanted to add additional content types. So the first type that we added was just an image, which was stored locally. The second iteration was get the image from the server, and then third iteration would be actually display videos. So let's go with the first one. Did we implement full screen templates? Yes, we did. And for that, I'm going to show you an example that we're currently using. So this is our cycle assessment result. And our cycle assessment, so when the users take an assessment, they get this kind of response. And because it is a lot of information with a lot of scientific resources, we didn't want them just to have a tidbit. We want them to read the whole thing and understand. So that is why this was our first iteration of the full screen template. The second thing that we wanted to do, as I told you before, we wanted to incorporate more animations. The problem with this is that it's a bit ambitious. So I am okay to say that it's a still in progress kind of situation. And last but not least, the additional content types. Did we implement that? Oh, yes, we did. Okay. So now it's demo time. Bear with me. I'm going to show you what we did. So this is our Clue app, as you see right here. And here I have a card which says, welcome everybody, with an image. Oh, not a video. Let me find an image. And then, oh, not that. OK. I'm not, oh, I'm putting it the wrong way. <laughs> it's this one. OK. So we have, this is our template that we have from the back end. So Pragma Conference, welcome everybody, and then an image. So what I'm going to do is what I'm going to send a new card to say hello. And if we see here, we say, welcome everybody. I hope you're having a lot of fun today. But what happens if we want to support video? So if we want to support video, let me just change this. Video, and then just video here, sorry, URL. And then I copy exactly what I had before that was put in the wrong one. And here. And see if I wanted to copy something more. Nope, that's fine. 
So let's save this and let's start the send again and send another one. And send. Oh? No, no, of course, of course. I'm just saying, I was just going to show you. So right now, I tried to put something and didn't, that doesn't look like anything because our system does not know that there's a video. So again, there's a video and URL. So now let's implement live the, uh, here, with Xcode. Okay, so that's going to be a bit complicated too, copy and paste. Do not think about that. But, so we have here four kind of classes. So we have our segment view layout, which is actually the view that you're going to be represented. We have our segment view, which is the, like a programmatically description of the view. Then we have a view provider, which is a type alias for our standard view provider to know exactly this is our view provider, and the segment view model. Let's start with the segment view model. So what we do, come on. Oh. Oh, no. So I'm going to copy some kind of code because of a matter of time, I don't have much time. So in the view model, we're going to have this. Okay, so we're going to have our URL. The creation is a value defined stage. Ah, oh, it's missing. Oh. I have two lines. Ah, oh, okay. Ah, oh, thank you very much. Life coding, helpful. <laughs> Okay, so now video segment view model. Okay, extension, so, so top level. Ah, oh, because I put this one extra. Yes, perfect. Okay, so now we have our URL. So what this view model will get is that when it gets the JSON responder, it will extract the URL string, create it into a URL, and stores it. But now, what do we have to do? We have to have our segment view to be able to display some kind of data. So for that, I'm going to add an AV player. And the first thing I have to do in this case is I have to conform to a protocol that we have, which is called configurable. Configurable, right? Cool. So now I'm going to add this function, configure, which will which will add an AV player. So what this configure will get is it will get a view model which is a type video segment view model, it will extract the URL and it will start it into an AV player. We also set the frame, the video gravity, and gra uh, sorry, put this AV player into the video view. Okay, so now we're done with that. What is the segment view provider? The segment view provider, again, is a type alias of type standard view provider, which will get two things, which are the video segment view model and the video segment view. So, okay, now we know exactly what to parse, but our view provider decoder does not know about this. So we have to go to our view provider decoder. In our view provider decoder, as I explained before, we have several kinds of segments. So it knows right now about header, text blocks, images, and such, but it does not know about video. So the first thing that we do is we go to the segment ID and we create a new static so video equals to video. Cool. So now we have that. Now we come back to our view provider decoder and we just call segment uh, segment v dot video video mm hmm View, video, video segment view model. Oh, I didn't realize. I'll come back. Uh, I know, I know. <laughs> ah, come on, play with me, Xcode. Ah, video, view provider. Perfect. Cool. Uh, self. Uh, self. <laughs> come on. <laughs> I can do this. I know how to type. <laughs> okay. So, and now is the part that I have to do this again. Uh, 
and where my friend recommended me to have jokes, which I don't have, um, and I've been trying to do stand-up comedy, but it's also not helping, so bear with me. The build times are a bit taking too long, so we are all gonna wait for a bit. Come on. I promise I'll tell my tech lead to help me out with this after this. <laughs> Uh, yes. <laughs> so now if everything went okay, I will create now, send a video, and as you see here, now we support videos. Okay, now let's get back. We made the demo, it was a bit bumpy, but it was fine. What are the lessons that we learned with this? <laughs> so the lessons that we learned with this is that we did it. The first thing we learned is an easy to maintain system that can be defined by design. The second one is that it is multi-platform. Third one is it's independent of the release cycle process. And the fourth is that there's no need to reuse code for UI views. So let's deconstruct each one of these. The first one is easy to maintain system that can be defined by design. That is actually not so true anymore. We created an easy to maintain system that can be defined by any department of the company. So for example, messaging, science, or content. And as I told you before, the takeaway that I want you to have with this is that it is important in a company to sit a lot of people together with different kind of perspectives. Because in that way, you create a common language that we all talk about. And us as developers, we relay a lot on product to be able to say, oh, you need to define this, we're just gonna implement. No, actually invite people who will be using and let them talk to you on what they need and how together we can work with this. Um, if your company wants to do something like this but they don't have much more time, you can use something like Brace. Brace is a messaging system that also has custom UIs and custom cards like this. The reason we decided not to go with Brace is because we wanted to try with new kind of components or new kind of segments, um, which it was not very flexible when you use a system like this. But if you just want to show cards like this, this is a system that is perfect for you. The second one is the multi-platform. The multi-platform actually transformed into, for us into feature parity and consistency between platforms. So if you're in a company that supports, for example, Android and iOS, what you normally do is that you go out with one first, see how it performs, and then you go with the other. But sometimes the, the experience that the user has is not seamless, it's not the same. So with this kind of features, when you sit everybody together, you can talk about the benefit and the pitfalls of each platform and try to provide a consistent experience for the user, which is a really plus to have. The third is independent of the release cycle process, which actually has a caveat. It is only if you don't need to add new segments. So right now, our first iteration just have predefined segments, but if, again, if we wanted to add video, we needed to create a new build and upload it to Apple. So my recommendation is try to come up with as many segments as you want beforehand, so you're able to easily use these blocks as Lego blocks. And then there's no need to reuse code for UI views. This is still the same. Because we don't need to constantly create template one, template two, template three, and so on. So this is a bit of what I wanted to tell to you today. And if you have any questions, I'm the kind of person that loves to explain them like in person. So please grab me beforehand. And if not, if you don't have any time, just tweet at me at Kate Castellano. So thank you very much for coming with me to this journey. And thanks for being here at Pragma.